It's time for the Ball Quest Mailbag Podcast, answering your questions from the General's Quarters every week, right here on Ball Quest. Good Thursday, everybody, and welcome to the Mailbag Podcast right here at BallQuest.com. Appreciate you guys for hanging out with us. we got a lot of questions to get into as UT Martin is on deck, but of course, a lot of the questions still revolving around the win over Alabama. And they have plenty of coverage over here at BallQuest.com. $1 for one year, you can get on it. And of course, hit that like button, subscribe to VolQuest on YouTube as well. All right, our first question comes from Hot Rod Vol. Will UT be able to hit the portal heavy, Austin Price? I mean, they're certainly going to try. And a lot of it depends on how much, you know, attrition they have themselves. Um, you know, they'll have people that, you know, may stick around, may think about it. I mean, the windows right now, hover are, 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 are going to change how all this plays out, in my opinion, because kids are going to be forced into like, man, if I'm going, you got to go, right? Like, there's no kind of like, eh, maybe let's, let's tease and ploy and let's see if we can get more NIL money. I mean, to me, a lot of it's, this is going to be like, boom, boom. Yeah, I think so. And, and then, of course, you got a couple of other variables out there. Um, Darnell Wright keeps playing the way he's playing. That's going to put room on your 85 because he's going to, I mean, going into the season, I, I thought there was a really good shot that Darnell Wright would come back. If he keeps playing the play the way he's playing right now, nobody's going to advise him to come back. Jalen Hyatt, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that was never even a thought. I'm not saying that he's looking to leave or Darnell Wright's for sure leaving, but the there's going to be some guys in a position potentially to have to make some decisions come late December 1st of January outside of that transfer portal window, which means you're going to have to get some work done in the spring. And these new windows are really fascinating because it's going to happen really fast right after Thanksgiving, right before signing day. And then the other windows right in the middle of spring practice. <laughs> so uh, as a coach, you've got to figure some stuff out and, and as players, you're going to have to make quick decisions as well. I, I mean, the, the portal's here to stay, and, and we've seen the benefits of the portal. Alabama, Rob Lewis is not Alabama. It, it's not even com- is, is not in the same world with, with some teams if they don't have Jameer Gibbs because they don't have running backs behind the, him that are typical Alabama running backs, right? Tennessee, where's Tennessee without Brew McCoy um, and, and Hendon Hooker? By the way, how about this? One high school team in California Saturday had Brew McCoy, Chase McGrath, Bryce Young on the field at the same time. They were all three teammates. Pretty good high school team in California, those three guys made up. But anyway, my, my point being, Rob, you know, you got to fill spots. And Tennessee is in a position, should be in a position with success to fill spots with better players than they've been in previously. Yeah. And it's just like Nick Saban said a few years ago when he was arguing against the portal. I can't remember what his press conference, his quote was. He was like, hey, you know, you, you think it's going to, you know, hurt us, but don't you think that some of those kids are going to want to come here and play? And it, Tennessee has done a great job with it. They wouldn't be with it where they were, but they fell backwards into Hidden Hooker. Let's be honest. That one, that one did not move the needle at all nope. when he when when he committed from Virginia Tech. Nobody cared. I mean, AP. I'm sure. I, I don't even remember, but I'm, I'm sure AP broke the news. I, I don't remember what it was. I think people. I think people had. Um, a little bit of excitement when he announced, okay, because you know he had been a playmaker and he reminded so many people of Dobbs. Well, but they didn't think they'd gotten the Heisman Trophy. I think Rob's it. right is is after spring ball when he was just checked down, checked down, checked down, not moving the ball vertically, just you know, just seemed like you know not a good fit. I think that's when people were like, yeah, I, no, but they had they had the second coming. They had Harrison Bailey, you know, on the way. They had Joe Milton who could. <laughs> Who could th- Joe Milton? Who could throw a, g- a gajillion miles coming from you know Michigan with a capital M? But anyway, my, my point being, Tennessee is getting ready to elevate itself. I think into the kind of transfers that that it can get, like you know, Jamison Williams going from Ohio State to to Alabama. I mean, I, I think Tennessee is getting ready to be in that zip code of transfers. Let's go to Smoky Man Fifteen, best VFL alum in town, uh, and their comment or reaction to the Bama win. Any shareable stories, and also, how does this weekend rank all time covering the job for Vol Sports? Um, AP, why don't you start us off on either of those two? Uh, man, all those former Vols were so excited, man. I mean, you know, I hung out with a bunch of them down there in the last couple of minutes of the game. They're all nervous. I mean. A couple of them reference now that I, you know this is so much worse as a as a spectator than as a former player, and, he, and these were guys that beat Alabama. You know, um, 
I thought Kevin Mays' quote afterwards was really good. You know, we'll remember it on my deathbed. You know, I mean, you know, remember, you know, Cade didn't beat Alabama. Kevin didn't, never beat Alabama. Now, Michael Frog, you know, um, Kevin's brother-in-law and um, Cooper and Cade's uncle. Now, he did beat Alabama. But, you know, as far as immediate family, Cooper was the first one. Um, you know, I, I just think there was just, just a lot of excitement. As far as me, um, yeah, man, it was neat. I was you know, underneath the right upright in 04 when Will White made the field goal. Um you know, it, it was, uh, it, again, we've watched a lot of suck for the last 15 years. And, um, you know, it, 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 you just kind of ride the wave while you can. You, it, it, this could be fleeting. It could be lasting. Who knows? But, you know, going to stay in the moment. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's 700 former players at the game through the years now. I mean, that's obviously over a long period of time. But 700 guys, you know, to see – to see the joy on on a guy like Leonard Little's face after the game, not just on the tweet, but I saw him in the tunnel afterwards, and Fred White, and those guys who have championed Tennessee publicly. I mean, they they've they've never wavered when Tennessee was bad, frustrated, yes, but I mean they've always been Tennessee, right? They never they never alienated themselves or, or left. Uh, so you know, to see those guys' happiness was good. And then from a coverage standpoint, for for me, it was just seeing just kind of the joy and exhale from the Tennessee fans on the field. I mean, it was just – they just didn't want to leave. You know what I mean? It, it was like, it was like, please tell me the ride's not over. I mean, it, it was – that's the calmest field rush I've ever seen. Once, once, the, once the first 30 seconds of it passed and everybody fell over the wall and they got on the field, then it was just like – it was like they were at a big outdoor concert. We don't have to leave, do we? We're just going to hang out here. It was kind of – it was – it felt different than 98 from that standpoint. 98 yeah. felt like a stampede where you're going to get trampled. This one felt more uh, almost mellow a- after the, after the, just the first wave of people falling onto the field. The only time it felt like a stampede is when the goalpost is actually coming your way. Well, I'll tell, tell you, Hover, one reason I think it felt like that is because there were, it wasn't just students in Bedlam. Yeah, there, were, there were three generations. Of the old guys that came up to me and Hover in the game. Field. There, I mean, I was walking to the walking down to the to the interview room, and you know, there were it, it took forever to get across the field, but there were also, you know, ex- excuse me, ma'am, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, it was just like, hey, hey, kid, get out of my way, like, hey, ex- excuse me, miss, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bump you there. I mean, there were it was it's not videos of that, are you? We're not going to suspend you like Alabama may have to suspend. Was it the her. lady grabbing? No, the, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. The I, didn't there. I didn't like come from like. Six to twelve, like Jermaine Burton, and, and hit a co-ed. Woo. at all. All right, let's go. Uh, there's some draft uh, eligible questions and whatnot. Brant, why don't you take these? I'll just run through them. This is from Balls Ten Twenty Four. In terms of draft, they go and they coming back. What do you think? Uh, Jalen Hyatt, Jeremy Banks, Amari Thomas, Byron Young, Bruce McCoy, Juwan Mitchell. Juwan Mitchell obviously has no more eligibility remaining. Byron Young is done. He cannot. He, he cannot return. His eligibility is over. Yeah. Um. Omari Thomas, I think we'll be back. Jalen Hyatt, I think we'll be back. But, you Woo! know, if, if, I do. I really do. I think he'll be back. Um, uh, I think there's a chance that he doesn't come back, but I think that there's the, more than 50% chance he comes back. Um, Jeremy Banks will not be back. It, it, just try to get him – just try to keep him – just try, try to keep him clean until, until December, right? I mean, like, you know, he um, – And then Brew who was the other will one? Be back. Who was the other one? Brew. I think Brew will be back. Um, I think Brew sees that hit next year could be his like Cedric Tillman, like heavy targets type year. And, yeah. you know, again, I think a lot of it goes back to age. You look at Darnell Wright. Hubs talked about him earlier. And I agree. Like, I think the last two games have kind of maybe changed some things for Darnell because of what he, who he's done it against. Um, but at the same time, Darnell is, it started when he started as a freshman, he was 17. Like, he, he won't, he could play five full seasons. As, and 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 finish as a 22 year old, get drafted as a 22 year old, and would turn 23 while he's in uh, his first camp in the NFL. So, like in comparison, you look at 2024 four star running back Jared Gibson. He's either already 17 as a junior in high school, or just about to turn 17. <laughs> so, yeah. So, AP, I mean, to, to be clear, you feel like there will be a Hyatt on the roster next year at wide receivers. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a better than fifty percent chance Jalen returns, but I, I wouldn't say it's a slam dunk that he's back. But I, I do think that that's where it tend to lean right now. 
Also, his balls. Hey, th thanks for answering the question, Eric, directed at me, AP. I appreciate that. <laughs> that was awesome. Well, Normally, Eric answers the questions himself per, <laughs> per, per, per Brent Packer, who I get that text from every week. So, you know. I mean, am, am I not allowed to have an opinion here? Hey, hey, no, here you're the here's, host. Here's the, th here's the thing on – Here's the thing. Sorry, on Brent Packer. <laughs> here's the thing Brent. on Jalen um, with, um, with that is, is what is what is the receiver – what does the receiver draft board look like? And here's the thing that's changed in receivers – they come off the board earlier now in the draft because of the way the NFL game has changed, right? I mean, it used to be that receivers weren't the hottest commodity, but now everybody's looking for a game change in receiver, not a game change in running back. So that part of it's a little bit different, which is something that, that Jalen Hyatt will have to look at and consider and dive into when he thinks about kind of where he's at. What does that board look like? And the understanding that receivers are a hotter commodity in the NFL draft than they've ever been. Yeah, no doubt about it. Let's go to Sparta Vol. What offensive and defensive players do you see getting increased playing time during the second half of the season? Brant, why don't you do this one if AP doesn't step over you? <laughs> why don't you go ahead and answer, Eric? Yeah, if you'll allow me to, Brant, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, will Brant allow you to? Uh, go ahead, Eric. Go ahead. You know, Joshua Joseph is already a guy that you're seeing getting more and more playing time. We've talked about him. He had 39 snaps against Alabama, which was huge. I continue to think that Tyree West will be a guy that gets more run. And and then as the secondary continues to get uh, a little bit healthier, I mean, you know, why not Brandon Turner who's gaining some confidence or albeit maybe a Danico Slaughter coming in and playing some safety if they don't want those guys playing 85 snaps. I just kind of look at it there. Offensively, I guess Ramel Keaton would be the only one because when Cedric Tillman comes back, he could maybe get some run. But, Brent, they don't play anybody offensively except for their guys, right? Yeah, I don't see anything really changing offensively. Maybe some Dylan Sampson if they need to, but I think they're pretty content. Jalen Wright, by the way, Austin and I were talking about this earlier. I mean, he's playing really well. Now, he scares you a little bit because everybody's ripping at the football and trying to tackle the football. Uh, but, but Rob, I, I think he's running with more power uh, than, than he's ever run with, and, and I think he's starting to feel the college game. I, I thought Jalen Hyatt was really good on Saturday against Alabama. I thought he was the best. He was, he was, I mean, no offense to Jabari Small, who – Played tough, played big. I mean, Jay, I thought Jalen Wright was their best running back on Saturday. Yeah, and, and that's a... not been the case every Saturday. I just thought, you know, Saturday he, he was. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to do the research, but I, w I wish we had ESPN's like research department. Hummer, how long do you think it's been, or do you think it's ever happened that a in a top ten matchup, one team played 14 offensive players? They made three subs, and one of those was Joe Milton, who came in to. You know, for for one play to, to heave it deep. Yeah, I mean it, it's it doesn't happen, but that's where Tennessee's at. And again, part of that's because they go fast. When you score in five plays, there's not but really. It's, a chance it's to still stub. pretty remarkable. It is <laughs> no, I mean it's totally remarkable. But I mean everybody's like, why is there not more of a receiver rotation? It's like, well, do you want to start to drive with Brew and and, and those guys on the sideline because they may not have a chance to get into the game, yeah. right? I mean the drive may be over before you got a chance to sub or or in the end zone. I mean. Somebody goes out there on first and ten, and Jalen Hyatt's not out there. Fans are going to be going, "What in the world? <laughs> what in the world are you doing?" Um, and so that's part of why that substitution. And I'm not sure they'll ever go really deep at the wide receiver spot because of the style of play. I think it really makes it hard. I think Brandon Turnage is interesting in the secondary, Eric, uh, because I think he played better than they thought. Do they have the confidence? Maybe he's not a great practice player, but but he played well. I and mean, you look at the one start he had a year ago; he played well. Then he kind of disappeared. What do they do with him? Can a James Pierce start to figure it out and get a little get get some snaps here and there? I'll be curious to see if they get him on the field Saturday against UT Martin. And I think Elijah Herring could continue to play some, uh, you know, a little bit more at linebacker moving forward if an opportunity presents itself. They're playing a lot of guys on defense, though. There's not yeah. there's not yeah, really any, other than other than Ty, um, James Pierce, there's not really any defensive lineman left for Roddy to play, right? I mean, he, he's pretty much empty in the bucket every week. There's two, but they're red shirts, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, so uh, maybe some guys in the secondary and, and maybe Elijah Herring at linebacker. Uh, but I, I don't – I think I think who you've seen through six games is a large part of what this team's going to be the back half of this season. I agree. I don't think that you're going to see any necessarily even any more of him, but I do want to give him a lot of credit is Dominic Bailey. 
a guy that a lot of, I mean, like you look at like Ramel Keaton, Dominic Bailey, there, there were guys last year too, that I think everybody, whether they cover the team, they're a fan or whatever, just like, you just forget about them. Like, you know, you, you don't even say you write them off. You just, you forget they're on the team and all of a sudden these guys are out there making plays and, and Dominic Bailey has done a really nice job. And I know coach Garner is very pleased with just kind of the, you know, the progression that he's had. Here's a really good one. It's fitting considering where we are on the season as well. Sam Smith, 2233. Are you surprised Tennessee hasn't went full force with a hooker for Heisman campaign? Brent, you might be the one that to answer this. I mean, do you know, you know what a plan would be for that? If there is a plan, uh, are you surprised? Well, I don't, in this day and age, I don't know that you have to do a campaign because there's so much, I mean, every highlights out there on Twitter, um, you know, it, it, it's not like it's not like somebody on the West Coast didn't get a chance to watch the game. You know, we, we, I mean, it's just it's different now that way. The other thing, too, is I'm not sure Hooker's personality is all about campaigning for something either. You know, I, I think he likes the low key approach. I mean, what does he do media after a game once a week? And, and that's kind of all that he does. Uh, he hasn't done a bunch of sit down, big picture type stories. So I, I think he's kind of kind of keeps it in a low key deal. Um, so you got to get a guy who's really engaged and want to do that. But again, I don't think you have to campaign for a guy in a power five league, Rob Lewis, like, like you had two years ago. No, I, I just think it's different. I think that's a great point. I mean, when you talk about social media, Twitter, I mean, just, I mean, just think about it. You, like you said about the West coast, even if it was, it was noon and you know, you were, getting your kids to soccer and, and everything before you and, – and, you, and you're a college football fan living in, on the West Coast before you settle down to watch your team at 3.30 or 4 or whatever, you knew everything that happened in a Tennessee-Alabama game. You, if you were – you know, if you're a hardcore college football fan, you saw it on Twitter, you saw it on, you know, coming coming across your timeline on Facebook or whatever. So, yeah, I I, I, I had I had not really thought about it before, Brett, but, but I think that's a great point that you just don't have to be, you know – a a camera hog like Baker Mayfield, you know, and like, like you did even, you know, five, six, seven years ago to, to get your name out there. Another one here from Sam Smith. Do we see Tennessee go freshman heavy this week in the secondary? I, I feel like there's going to be a lot of, uh, a, a lot of reserves in there playing a lot of football this week. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think you're going to see them play Christian Harrison, play a bunch of those guys in the back end, and why not, right? I mean, this is a game where Andre Turrentine needs to get more run. you got to see what you can you got from him going forward. Um, you know, Wesley Walker's got to continue to play more. I think he's got to play more, period. Um, you know, I mean, technically he could grad transfer at the end of the year, so if he's not playing, right, I mean, like, does he want to stick around? I mean, I know everybody gets swept up in Tennessee's undefeated, but at the end of the day, a lot of these kids just want to play. You know, I mean, they're having a good time winning, but, you know, they also want to, you know, be on the field helping. So um, I think that you look at, you know, the secondary or just a lot of the wide receiver, like, isn't this the perfect game for Chuck Chaz and Emrod? He's finally healthy. The staff likes him a ton. Caleb Webb, Squirrel White, you know, Walker Merrill. These are games where, like, you know, those guys should be playing quite a few snaps. Oh, this is a game where you don't take a chance with anybody that, that that's remote. Like, like Kamal Haddon? No. Get your get your hamstring well, right? I mean, Cedric Tillman doesn't need to play this week. You need to get guys off the field as quick as you can get them off the field. I'll have the old line let the, clubs. Yeah, let the young guys play. I mean, get those offensive linemen off the field. Let's see R.J. Perry at tackle. You know, let, let's see some other guys on the offensive line and see where they're at. I mean, I think you got to be smart in this football game. I said this on the round table. I think, you know, it's different than it was Ball State or Akron to me because of where you are as a football team. So don't, you know, you go out of your way in a game like this to make sure you don't take any un, unnecessary chances. So I, I play young guys early and often uh, at all positions, not just the secondary. A couple of good questions here from do little ball, uh, very popular on the Monday night chat with the way the season has gone. Where are the odds? Golish is a head coach somewhere next season. What are the odds? Golish is a head coach somewhere next season. I think they're go up by the week. You see him get more and more praise, whether it be through Matt Zenitz at on three, um, Kirk Herbstreet tossing his name out there. I, I, I think the best thing going for Tennessee with, with Golish is, you know, obviously like him getting a head coach, that's a good look on Heifel, right? But I think that the fact that he's getting so much praise, 
that if the right thing don't come along, I don't think he feels like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm calling all these plays, hype's getting all the credit and I, I want to go be an OC somewhere else. Like I think he'll either find a head job that fits him or he'll stay here. Like one of the two, like, I don't think you'll see that. Sometimes you see that knee jerk cover where like, you know, a, a said coordinator is not getting the love he thinks he should be getting the head coach is and they need jerk and leave. I don't think that's goalish at all. And goalish is getting quite a bit of you know credit and love the last two, three weeks. Yeah, I think the other thing too, Rob, is Alex Goalish is pretty seasoned, right? He's been he's been multiple places. And so I don't think he's gonna jump at the first opportunity that's out there for him. I mean, what kind of support they have for the staff and he he's smart enough, Rob, that he's gonna look at it from all sides former Mac coach, you know, he's been at Iowa State. He, he knows what resources are like and how important those things are. So I think he will be, I don't want to say cautious, but he will be very calculating before he takes his first step somewhere. Because, if, you know, a lot of for a lot of guys, if that first step fails, it's hard to get a second opportunity. Oh, sure. I mean, I think he's in a position, I mean, in, in every coach, I mean, not, I'm just, I mean, even a position coach looking to move up to a better – I think everybody on that staff is in a position where they can be selective right now. I mean, it, it's rolling. It's, I mean, ten, don't you, I mean, everybody's going to get a raise. You know, it's kind of like yeah. Rodney Garner, <laughs> kind of like Rodney Dangerfield in, in a Caddyshack, except we're all going to get a raise. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know? Danny, it, it may take them, uh, it may take them 11 months to get the contract <laughs> finalized, but all the checks are going to be written. Yeah. <laughs> we may not know about it until two years down the road, you know, until they've, they've all ca- they've cashed all those checks. I've already got another bonus because uh, bowl eligibility. So, so I just, yeah, I, I mean, Hubber, I think you make great points. I mean, I, I I think Coach Gullish realizes what he's got and, uh, and the support, the resources. What you're saying, it would be. I don't. I, I don't think he's going to be short sighted and jump somewhere just so he can wear the headset and and, and carry the, the clipboard on the sideline. Now, follow up question to that: If he were to leave somewhere this off season, you open it up, you'll interview some people. But who would be the internal candidate, uh, Brent? I. I mean, Ellerby's been with Heupel for a long time, but I don't know if there is an internal candidate. No, I mean, I don't think it's Glenn Ellerby. I um, mean, you know, where does Joey, Joey Halsey? Halsey where, where is he at? Is he ready to call it? Um, you know, would, would Heupel go back to calling it 100% and, and have a guy like Halsey be his eyes upstairs? You know, would, would you know, where's Jeff Levy outside the program? And what's that no. like in Oklahoma? Oh, Hubbard, no Hubbard, that's just still a chum in the water. For the I got no right. idea. I, I, know, chum in the water. I don't know where they would go if they, and I don't, I mean, listen, I didn't think they were going to go in house with a, with an analyst to be the receivers coach. And I, and I'll tell you what, that's turned out to be a really good move. Austin price with the way this receiving group is playing. Yeah. Kel- Kelsey's yeah, got a huge yeah. buy-in from the kids. Yeah. And then he's also just very relatable. He's not that old, but he's not that young either. So like he he's he's, he's got the, the as the kids would say he's fresh. So uh, you know he, he he's got enough. Uh, you know, I guess just kind of what's what is the word like? Uh, I'm trying to think of the word here. He's just got enough. I, I don't. He, he's relatable. I'll be honest with you. He's relatable for kids. Swag, and, trip, you know, swag. There you go. I mean, I, again, and 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 I think it helps in recruiting. Um, he's young, so he's not proven himself. So he's he's hungry to be proven, and so you know I think that helps as well. And so again, I, I think that's been a really good hire. And and the fact you've got some vets in that room, Tillman, Brew, Brew's an older guy. I mean, he's 21, 22 years old. It's not like he's new. Um, you know, they they understand how to work. And then of course Jalen's been driven this off season, so I think that's helped him as well. I, I'm sorry. I, I I was just imagining Addison and Avery when you come down the steps and your latest Peter Millar going, Dad's fresh. <laughs> this is true. I, I had a uh, what was I wearing Saturday? I a Peter Millar tank top when you came I, downstairs. I, I had a, I had I had navy and orange on, and Addison said, "You know, I really like that combination." And I'm like, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, Rob, you're you're a seasoned veteran in this business. At Answer least. this one. <laughs> Where do you rank Bryce Young on the list of best opposing quarterbacks you've seen at Neyland Stadium? Ah, best opposing quarterbacks I've seen at Neyland Stadium. Wow, man, that's a good question. Uh, he's better than Tim Tebow. Heisman Trophy winner. He's – golly, man. Hubbard, is he the best guy we've seen in there? 
Joe Burrow didn't play in Neyland Stadium. He's the best at keeping his eyes down the field. And, AP, and- I, that's a great – yeah, that's a great. As far as like when he when stuff starts collapsing and 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 falling down, yeah, he that touchdown to Latou is incredible. Incredible. He, I mean, it he's, was. He's, and he's and way, I thought the play. I thought the play after Amari Thomas sacked him, like they were right back down his neck again. Oh, 43 and, yard completion. Boom. Yeah. So, and he he's better than Danny Werfel. He's better than Jamarcus Russell. My favorite interview of all time. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> Sarcasm, sarcasm, fun. Oh. Um, uh, I mean, you know, you can again. The game's different, right? So, I mean, how quarterbacks are playing now is very different than 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 other years. I mean, that performance is one of the best individual all all position performances I've seen by an opposing player in Neyland Stadium. I mean, you throw receivers, throw running backs in there. I mean. Maybe you bring in an Alabama running back, Rob, from from years ago. Um, but, I mean, he was – I mean, he bailed Alabama out so many times with what he did and made plays. Um, I knew he was good. He he's, he played better than I thought he could ever yeah. – and, and I'm not talking about the shoulder. I'm just talking about playing in general. This is – I've, I've been – I thought about this the other night. I've not, had, I've not said it or written it. But, to me, the biggest – I mean, takeaway from that game and shows you a good Bryce Young. Everything Alabama got was because of Bryce Young, I think. Not because Bill O'Brien called a great game or scheme thing. And when Tennessee scored, it looked easy. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, it was Josh Heupel had, had schemed something up or Hendon Hooker found Jalen Hyatt. And Bryce Young just kept him in it by making play after play after play. And to me, I mean, Alabama scored 49 points, but it wasn't an easy 49. I mean, that kid – played his butt off and when Tennessee scored it was just like poof. Yeah, the big plays they had to drive the field on Tennessee. The one the one play by by um Jameer Gibbs where he kind of put one foot in the ground and I mean that was whew, yeah it was ridiculous. Man, I mean, and, and, and I just thought of something this is good. Uh, Hubbard's the only one that can echo this and even I'm I'm older than Hubbard. Kane was not a thought in, in anybody's second date yet. I'm still not. So I saw fun. Dan Marino play in Neyland Stadium. Wow! Pretty saw good. Dan Marino beat the Vols, but yeah. I think to the, I think Pittsburgh also scored, also scored 13 points that day. So, <laughs> hey, would the, would the reason Anthony Richardson wouldn't be on that list, Hubber, is it one of the best performances in Neyland Stadium from opposing quarterback because Tennessee gave him everything? And yeah, I, I mean, I mean, it was a, it was a total different approach. I mean, Tennessee's playing yeah. contain, and and then they've got these big windows and zones. And this one was like, I he mean, earned it. Yeah, I mean, he got not. I mean, the thing that Anthony Richardson showed to to NFL people. I mean, size is going to be a concern, but he showed an incredible amount of toughness. He got the absolute crap knocked out of him for for four quarters. Am I young? Getting, I mean, yeah, Bryce Young, yeah. and kept getting back up. I mean, Bryce Young. I mean, he got hit a lot and kept getting back up. I, I was, I was impressed by his toughness and and his kind of resiliency to continue to come back and, and make plays the, the the way that he did. So again, game's different, so it's hard to compare. You know what, what, what a, I mean, what a Jerome Bettis or a Herschel Walker or you know some of those guys. You know Dan Marino, as as Rob mentioned. I mean, that's a Hall of Fame guy, but that's playing in, in a year where you throw it. 18 times a game is, is 20 times a game. And that era is a big, a big day throwing the football. So just different eras that way. I just thought, I thought Bryce Young was terrific. He was. And, and Hubbard, to your point about his toughness, uh, we were all worried about his, sh- we're not worried. We we're all looking at his shoulder. Whatever that Jeremy Banks got him good, like really good early. I don't know if it was his first possession, but that hit the end zone with forced a punt and, yeah. and dude just popped up and like never, I mean, he might've been hurting, but he never showed it. Yeah, if uh, if he was hurting, I don't want to see him not hurting because goodness gracious. Uh, Tennessee Walker, Austin, this is a question for you. What players are most likely redshirted uh, this season? Uh, the, you you mentioned the two D linemen earlier. Um, you know, Caleb. Uh, Jason Jenkins and um, yeah, uh, Caleb, Jordan Phillips. Yeah, Caleb Webb feels like he's headed for that unless he's played more special teams than I realize. Um, Nimrod. Nimrod, another one. Um you know, outside of that, I mean, you know, of, all the O linemen, all those O linemen, you know, um, 
maybe Addison Nichols is forced into playing more, but most of those O-linemen, almost all of them, if not all of them, are going to be red shirts. Do we expect the secondary players that missed the game or left the game early to be healthy by the Kentucky game? I think that's just a day-by-day thing, and if there's – um. If there's a thought that they're not healthy, they're not playing this week, Brent. Yeah, I mean, I think Rucker's going to be fine. That that appeared to be cramped. I think the one concern would be the hamstring, if that's what it was with Christian Charles. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, we don't know what Jalen McCullough's status is going to be and when there's going to be any kind of resolution there. I think Kamal Haddon's going to be back. Um, so, I, I think from an injury standpoint, Christian Charles is probably the one that you're wondering about the, the most at this point. All right, let's go to Matt's 42 12 Bigger day. Kelly Washington versus LSU or Hyatt versus Bama. Note, the 78-yarder to start the fourth quarter by Hyatt reminded me a lot of Washington's 70-yarder. Splits the defenders and all. Yeah, it was just on the opposite hash. I mean, it was basically the same Nick Saban coverage and, and kind of the same route. I, I think Washington caught it a little shorter or a little closer to the line of scrimmage than Jalen Hyatt did, but it certainly served a reminder of that. Um, I wonder if it reminded Saban of that. <laughs> probably, <laughs> it probably did. Uh, you know, the Washington thing was just kind of him coming completely out of the blue, Rob. I mean, we knew and we had heard a lot of buzz, but – and AP, you can jump in here too. I mean, that was just a little bit more of a, a – just kind of didn't see it coming. I, I think when you averaged 34 and a half yards a catch, you had a bigger day. I agree. I, I mean, that that's the – that – LSU game is the last game that I sat in the stands in, in Neyland Stadium and, and watched Tennessee play. And I thought, I, and th- again, could be recency bias. I, I thought Jalen was bigger just because of how huge the plays were, the opponent, you know, the, the setting, every, everything around the rivalry. And and Hubbard, I mean, I don't remember every single one of those Kelly Washington plays, but a lot of that's on K- – I mean, it, it was just him and Casey Clawson. They were just beating man-to-man coverage. I, I, the last like all day long. The last three were huge. They had just tied it at twenty-eight. Boom! Big play, touchdown. Mm-hmm. They had you know taken the lead after that missed extra point. Early fourth quarter, big play, touchdown, and then of course the one to tie the game late. So I mean, I, I'm with you, Rob. I you know the last three I thought were just it, 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 I mean, five, five touchdowns. That's pretty. I mean, K Dub had a great day, but five touchdowns is that that, that kind of sets the bar. To and again, right? I mean, this is. I mean, it's not it's not in a BS game like Akron. I mean, this is the I mean, this is this is it, right? I mean, this is against Alabama. Um, the stage is set, right? So I mean, it's just huge. Uh, a two parter here uh, with developments of the wide receivers with Brew, Ramel, and Hyatt. Does the offense change when Tillman comes back? Has to be nightmares for DCs. Austin, I feel like the offense won't change whatsoever. But this might be a play on one of the questions we got asked in the Monday night chat. Do you see more wide receiver sets with four? I would say no because they love having a tight end there. No, I just think what you'll do is you'll just use Ramel's spot. You know, Ramel will spot said some as he works his way back in. Ramel will spot brew some. I don't know if Hyatt will come off the field. No. Um, I mean, I, I guess in theory, maybe. Um, I was just thinking too, like, I mean, said's got to get back in shape too, right? I mean, yeah, like, I mean, you set out five, thing. six weeks. And I mean, you're not going to be in tip top shape, but again, like, you get him back if even if he's you know eighty percent as far as conditioning, like you're still, I mean, it, you know, Cedric Tillman's still Cedric Tillman. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that it definitely uh, makes the offense more complete. And then when you factor in how the all lines block and how the running backs are running, it, it just makes it that much better. If you take the tight end off the field, it allows the defense to play dime coverage. And it truly becomes more seven on seven because it takes the run game. It changes the run game because Tennessee's only got five to block in the run game. Okay. Then you're basically just running zone read. If you keep the tight end in the game, then defensively, you got to make some declarations on what you want to do, right? You're going to stay nickel and you can get those safety matchups depending on your formation and your motions and your shifts. We, we talked, uh, Galax Golish talked about it on Tuesday, and it's creating different pitchers for the defense to see. I think what they're doing with the tight end allows them to create more pitchers and more chaos for the defense than if you go just four wide and you're a little bit more stationary and it allows the defense to get into more extra extra defensive backs because it negates some of your run game prowess. Let's go down to Ath Run. Got a couple of questions here. Uh, Rob, did McGrath's kick get tipped or was it just plain beautifully ugly? Do we still not know the answer to that? I he said he didn't I, believe I've it. I've gone back and looked at it, and I can't tell. Yeah. I mean, it, 
there, I mean, the Alabama guy, I can't, I can't remember his name. I mean, he's there. I mean, he, he may have gotten a fingertip on it. Uh, EC, I mean, you, I know you watched it again. What, I mean, what did you think? I mean, I, I watched it three or four times. And I, I don't I know. I can't tell if he got a hand on it. I just, Brent, I think that, I think the McGrath kind of double clutched. It wasn't a hand, if anything, it was a fingernail. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I know a lot of people are like looking at the, you know, the trajectory of the ball and trying to say he knocked it back into back into a line to get over the goal. I don't believe that. And, and the upright. I, I I don't know. I've watched it. He didn't act like he hit it. You know what I mean? It, it, yes. it, it, I mean, he didn't have a reaction like, Hey, I've I just blocked this kick. So if it did, I think it was a very small graze. I don't, I don't think it was, if you're going to knock a ball and change its trajectory, you're going to hit it a lot harder. You're going to know you hit it. And he did not react like yeah. he knew he hit it. And I don't, it does not, that's not the reason it was a knuckleball. I mean, no. That's, it was, that was. Uh, you talk about reactions. I thought McGrath looked like I missed this. And then it <laughs> went in. And then like, like Ollie Lane's like, come on, man, let's get excited. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. I, I mean, that was one of those like blind chip shots where you hit it and you're like, oh, I just buried that into the fringe or whatever. And the next thing you know, everybody's cheering. You walk up and you go, hey, it's near the hole. I mean, that was kind of the McGrath like, oh, I totally missed it. Like, like when, a, 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 when AP sculled that one behind 12 in Augusta, thought it was going in the pond, it hit the flag stick and dropped in for a two. <sighs> Sadly, I hit it to eight feet on 12, Rob. I didn't, I, I was back there behind the, 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 Behind the green. AP, stay <laughs> with you. Big... Video, he'll post video of it later. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest recruiting impacts from beating Alabama? Uh, just the 24s, man. Uh, you know, I, I know we, you know, Caleb Beasley is going to announce on Friday, Spillman, Boo Carter, Marcus Gorey. Again, I'm not sure any of those guys are, I mean, outside of Beasley, going to decide like in the next couple of weeks or, or months, but. You know, Tennessee has established themselves as a major contender for a bunch of uh, all the in-state kids you really want, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, Tennessee's done a nice job with, you know, some different 24s and 25s that are out of state. And then with the 23s, you know, I think Tennessee's the team to beat for David Hobbs. I've said Tennessee and Alabama. I'm ready to go out there and say Tennessee is the team to beat. Now, that doesn't mean they'll win because they can still be beat. But, like, to me, they are right now – as we said here on October 20th, I think Tennessee is nudged ahead of Alabama. Can Alabama make up the ground? All right, last one. It goes to Scott J22. Let's have a little fun with this. If the NFL draft was today, who were the top three balls off the board? I'm going to add a caveat in there. When are they off the board? Um, Rob, why don't you kick us off here? You guys can all answer it if you want to. Uh, Darnell Wright, I don't know about when. I'll say second day. Uh, Hendon Hooker, Cedric Tillman. And I would say Tillman first. Yeah. So, so Tillman, right, then Hooker. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go Darnell Wright first round. Ooh. Cedric Tillman uh, early third round. Could be second round, too. It depends on how he runs and how he finishes the season. And then I'm going to go Jeremy Banks. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Rob's guy. I'm gonna go with Rob's three, uh, but I think I'm gonna put Darnell Wright first. Um, I don't know what the total run of of receivers looks like. Um, I think Jalen Hyatt, depending on how he finishes here, could be interesting with that because again, re- the NFL loves wide receivers, uh, but they also love offensive tackles. Now, the one thing about about Darnell Wright that's interesting is he's clearly more comfortable on the right side. The NFL is looking for a left tackle. You know, are there some, quote, true left tackles ahead of him because he's at his best on the right side? Um, but I think Darnell Wright's making money every time he goes out on the field with the way he's playing right now. So I would go Wright first. I don't think he can get – I'm not sure he could get to the first round. So I'm going to say second-round pick for Wright. Then I'm going to go um, – I will go Hooker then – no, I'll go Hooker then Tillman because I think Hooker's going to play really well down down the rest of the season. And, Hubbard, I think AP made a great point about Darnell, too, that's going to help him. His age mm-hmm. will we'll help him. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, and, and for that reason alone, that's going to be one of the knocks on Hendon Hooker, obviously, going in this draft process. He's playing great, but, gosh, he's 25 years old, right? Um, but then again, Joe Burrow was uh, super old as well, and uh, it's, it's worked out well for him. I'll go Darnell Wright second round. I'll go Hooker third round and i'll go tillman th- 
third round too as well. So yeah, it just I mean it's all about fit for somebody. It's not a great yeah. year for quarterbacks. It doesn't look like coming into the coming out for the draft, which is a help for Hendon Hooker. Um, you know, and again, what is the depth? How many guys come out at the receiver position? They draft that position more on potential than they do production oftentimes. So um, it's all about fits. You know, now I'll say this. One thing going in Cedric Tillman's favor, Joshua Palmer, Marquez Callaway, you know, some guys that have come through the program here, even under different coaches, have gone on and found some success in the NFL, which is an, an eye-opener for NFL teams that, hey, this guy knows how to work, he knows what to do, and he's been very productive in a new system. So we'll see. All right, that's going to do it here for this edition of the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast here on this Thursday. If you're listening right now, appreciate it. Stay uh, tuned for the rest of the week and obviously throughout Saturday as Tennessee takes on UT Morton at noon Eastern time. And if you haven't already, $1 for one year. Take advantage of the coverage, the best coverage out there for the 6-0 and Volunteers football team, $1 for one year. And if you're watching on YouTube, pound that like button. Help us uh, get as many likes as we possibly can. Pound it and subscribe and support the, uh, the site on uh, YouTube as well. For Austin Price. Got to be careful not to read your name tag there. Brett Hubbs and Rob Lewis. I am Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys for hanging out with us here on the Bellbag Podcast. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday, everybody. You've been listening to the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast every week right here on VolQuest.